Welcome everyone to Patent's Feature Match webinar series. You have joined the session called Feature Match, Closer Look, Sorting Through Word Prediction Systems. My name is Tammy Thompson-Cook and I am an educational consultant at Patent and the statewide team lead for the Assistive Technology Initiative. I am pleased to have Kelly as our guide through various topics in matching the features of technology to the needs and abilities of students. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that attendees are in listen-only mode and the session is being recorded. Handouts for this session are available on the patent website. I've also entered them into the chat window. There's a short link as well as the regular hyperlink to the patent page. Please use the Q&A feature to ask content relevant questions which will be monitored throughout the session and answered by Kelly as time allows. At the end of the live synchronous session, please listen carefully for the code that is needed for the continuing education verification. Kelly, with that, I will turn it over to you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and get us started. All right. Well, hello everyone. With um, the feature match series, I've been pleased to be asked by Tammy to, to do this with everyone. And there are several sessions that we have done and are, uh, will be continuing to do. And so the, the feature match process is one that I learned as a young assistive technology consultant. So my background is as a special educator, um, a special education teacher and assistive technology person of support um, to schools working in early childhood, elementary, middle and high school. Um, as a teacher, I didn't work full-time in middle school, but certainly as a support person I am. In more recent years, um, I did work at the um, Department of Education project prior to Patan. Um, and I've worked um, nationwide and internationally to support people who are learning about assistive technology assessment, implementation, and part of that is this feature match process. In the areas of assistive technology, I mean, do a lot in the area of a, uh, reading and writing supports, as well as augmentative communication, and this comes out of that work. Um, and you'll find in various places links to my website. So we're going to get, we're going to really dig in um, this term digging deeper seems to be the, the term of the year um, to an area of alternative writing that um, people explore for various reasons of support for writing. So we're going to talk about some of the basics, some of the differences. We'll give some examples um, and take a look at the assessment resources as I oh, screens are moving around. Um, as I've talked about in previous sessions, I thank my group of colleagues that I've worked with over the years that to develop this feature match series or sorting through series and we continue to add areas to it. Um, just in looking at alternative writing supports and I'm not going to go through all of these categories because this is more specific to the sorting through writing supports, but word prediction is often an item that gets look like, looked at in a continuum of writing supports, where word prediction originally was created as a support for individuals with physical challenges that struggled with typing at speeds that kept up with their level of work. And so we looked at word prediction for people originally who had an organized um, system of phonemic awareness and decoding skills. Whereas now we see word prediction being used just as much for individuals with physical challenges to help with the speed at which they write, but also for individuals that struggle with the cognitive act of writing. So it may be that um, there are language construction issues that go on as a part of the writing process. It may be spelling issues. It may be a combination of those items as well. And so we'll see word prediction used not just for individuals who are spelling and then get things speeded up, 
So here in this area of writing supports, um, in word prediction, I'm going to talk about word banks, word clouds, um, and word walls, and also take a look at word prediction and word completion. The features for the physical purpose. So when we talk about this whole feature match process, we're looking at what are the features that my particular student needs um, and why do they need them? So we often see that for physical purposes of providing word prediction, we're looking at things to reduce the number of keystrokes, to ease the fatigue from somebody that typing letter by letter, you know, is more exhausting than um, others. Um, we look for assist in spelling. We assist in grammar in some instances as a feature. And we're also looking at, for some reason my camera has shut down. I'm gonna turn this one off. Um, we're looking at some of the spacing supports, punctuation supports, things that automate that process for physical purposes, where if I hit um, a full stop, like a period, question mark, or exclamation point, the next word in the word prediction list is going to be automatically capitalized. So these are things that don't teach kids to capitalize it supports them in the function of capitalizing. There are some cognitive performance considerations for word prediction. Um, so things as you are interacting with the word prediction list as it's presented um, is that depending upon the number of words, the not whether the list is presented horizontally or vertically, um, for a person, they may be spending a lot of time visually searching for the word. So we might look to auditory supports. Can it be read out loud if they hover over it? Or if they first touch it on a touch screen, can they hear the word as an auditory cue before they choose it to put into their writing document? Often, because word prediction systems move forward, uh, as you type, the list changes and it shuffles. And sometimes individuals miss, they didn't see that the word was there in the list. And when the list continues to populate, it leaves out the words that were in previous lists. Um, and there are some settings in word prediction systems that allow you to have the most common words continuously predicted. So just in case somebody has missed it. Um, people spend time processing word prediction lists. So you have to think about the amount of time that they're putting into typing and spelling and then the reading of the list or having the list read to them. So we have to find um, the balance of how many words should be in this list. Early on in word prediction, there were um, systems that looked at only having three words at a time presented because of studies based upon eye movements where you would look at the top, the bottom, and the middle. And then they might expand that list, always seeming to be in numbers that were odd numbers so that I could always have a top, a bottom, and a middle, or I would scan down through them. And some research studies from um, University of Delaware with Skip and his team and Dave Eddyburn backed up um, this in research out of University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, is that if a word doesn't occur on the first part of the screen, so if you think about how there may be some screen limitations, if that word doesn't occur in the first three to five words, it won't be something that's chosen because individuals that are using word prediction rarely scroll down if you have 10, 20 items in that list. So I'm all of this is leading to, especially for people who are new to the area of word prediction, more, it's not necessarily better. More means more reading. More means more searching. And until somebody might be able to start out with maybe having three or four words predicted and grow into a much longer list.
but you need to account for that in your trials. Also using word prediction um, and any kind of on-screen or alternative keyboard has a shift in visual focus between where is the word prediction list presented and where do, is text entered into the document. So the mobility of the word prediction list around the screen is a feature that we look at. For some people, having the word prediction list move as they type is very helpful. And then other individuals, they need to have that word prediction list in a static location so that they can have um, this, you know, be able to anticipate the movement. So we have repetition of, I'm always looking for my word list in the same place. Some of you that work in the field of augmentative communication might be able to um, relate the language acquisition through movement patterns um, to that process. So adding that into your ideas of what you do with writing. We also look at what kind of word prediction it is. So we have two different groups here and you've got some um, images on your screen of different word prediction, visual presentations, things that are in um, Chromebooks, things that are on tablets, things that are built into phones, because we see word prediction and word completion systems in a variety of places. Sometimes people are using word prediction for absolutely everything that they type that kind of alternative writing group. Um, people that struggle either motorically or language wise that need to have that production along the way. We have some other people that turn word prediction on and off based upon the type of writing that they're doing. So in that more supportive group, it may be based upon if I'm writing a report versus I might not be using my word prediction if I'm doing fill in the blank kind of sentence completion tasks. In all of the, the areas of assistive technology, we look at feature match as a part of the whole process. I don't just dive in and say, okay, what features do you want? And we're gonna make this list and go through it that way. But I wanna find out background information, what brought somebody to word prediction, what brought them, to what kind of writing have they done? What kind of writing supports have they used in the past? I often meet um, upper elementary, middle and high schoolers that have used word banks on paper. So they're used to that kind of a strategy. And we will might put that in as a feature of the tool that we can transfer their word banks into word prediction um, uh, products for them and screens. When we're looking at all of this so technology, we look at different areas. So I want to talk specifically about this feature match process as it fits into word prediction. So with the student themselves, how are they accessing the word prediction list? How is that presented? And that's your human technology interface. Is it something, in some cases, I, ha I have a student right now that's using word prediction built into an eye gaze system. So she uses a Toby eye gaze with the grid on-screen keyboard. And in her on-screen keyboard, she has a word prediction list. Where that shows up on the screen, whether or not those word predictors have symbols next to them are all a part of, as we're working through the process with her, as to the, her final setup um, for what word prediction will look like. So, how do things need to be presented on the screen? How does somebody access them? Are they using eye gaze to um, choose an item from the word prediction list? Are they touching it? In the case of a touch sensitive screen or on a tablet based system, iPad, phone, is it something that they're using a single switch and they need to scan down through that um, word prediction list? separate from scanning their alphabet keyboard? Or is it an integrated system where the word predictor is built into the alphabet keyboard, thus not having as many screens around? Um, I've met some individuals where they'll have an on-screen keyboard, they've got a word bank, they've got a word prediction list, and there's like this much space for the written documentation. So we have to think about which systems might have 
these kinds of tools integrated so it's not three or four different things that are using uh, visual real estate um, on the screen. And speaking of visual real estate, in that processing piece, how are the words presented? Are they auditorily presented? Does that list get read right away or does somebody need to click on a word to hear it? Can they right click on a word and get a definition in the list if they're unsure of it? So those kinds of grammatical supports um, in word predictors. And then of course, what's the output? Um, when I choose something from the list, does it go directly into my document? Does it predict the next word that might be more co most commonly to follow it in the case of some of the word predictors that have grammar supports within them? And then what are the other features? You have um, in your handouts, possibly from other sessions, a more robust feature match list. We're going to be talking specifically here about writing and breaking down that those features for word prediction uh, and not all the areas of assistive technology. So as I've mentioned, what do I know about my student? What are their strengths when it comes to writing um, as it is physically producing letters from a keyboard um, or are they been handwriting with the support of printed word, um, word banks? Um, what are their needs? So what kinds of writings are they doing in their environment? You know, are they doing long um, work? Are they just doing short work? Have there been over accommodations made so that they're not being asked to do writing at all? Then I go back to the original curriculum. What are the rest of the kids around them doing? Um, if writing isn't a part of the curriculum, yeah, get it in. Because what we know is the more kids read, the better readers they are and the more kids write, the better readers they are. So if you're looking to impact reading skills, get your students writing with whatever kind of supports that may be mentioned in other sessions um, and the support of word prediction is often helpful once they're past those emergent stages of writing. The technology itself, as I mentioned, are broken down into how do I access it? Do I use, a, some my students might need to use a stylus to choose words from a smaller screen. Um, and then what is that output in other human factors? You have these things on other feature lists that are more robust. I'm not gonna go into detail with them here. Um, in this particular session, you can look to some other sessions to have some more details about the full range of features, knowing that these are names of assistive technology terms, what the human um, is doing or what the human support might need and the feature that you might find as you start to do your searches. There is associated with this particular feature match presentation, a customized list of features broken into categories of operating systems, the type of program, the selection method, the appearance of the word list or the window itself, um, how things get selected, how typing goes into the word prediction, um, whether the word prediction is based upon alphabet, frequency, word patterns, um, phonetic principles, the vocabulary size of the word predictor, um, and the auditory feedback from word prediction. And this um, list comes from work that I've done with my colleague, Scott Marfilius, as we've looked at different products. A caution, I'm gonna bring up my, my little caution flag, is you know, one of the cautions, yellow flag, is that you will find out on the internet when you do searches for feature matches, either lists that companies have put out so particular companies that produce products of word prediction or different agencies have done word prediction as a list and a compare and they might do these comparison charts. Recognize that the comparison charts from companies are going to favor the features that their products do the best what their products were promoted to do. So use those lists wisely. Any comparison list that had come out in previous years 
is going to be aged almost immediately um, when it was printed and produced. And so anything that has like features at the top and dots, 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 and check off lists, you need to make sure that you look at the date as to what time. And that's why I put that this particular feature match list um, was created in 2015. And there may be new features added to word predictors that haven't gone on this list yet. So you need to be very cognizant of when these comparison charts were done. There's a question that's a really great question that I want to take the time um, to ask about this idea of what grade do um, is recommended, because not about me, it's like what is recommended for starting this. You will find different responses to that based upon background and whether somebody's focusing on literacy characteristics of what a student is doing. Um, in more recent years, what I have been following the guidelines from an emergent writing developmental checklist called the Developmental Writing Scale, um, produced by Dr. Janet Sturm and her team out of um, Central Michigan University. And what Janet looks at is in those emergent stages where kids are choosing topics, where they are just starting to put letters together, does that letters represent things that are in print, that we don't use word prediction as those stages. And it's so it's not tied to grade level, it's tied to writing ability. Because I have students that are emergent writers that are three years old, and I have emergent writers who are eight years old. I have another one who's 15 um, that I'm working with. And for all of those kids, we want to give them the opportunity to start producing letter by letter writing. It doesn't, prior to using word prediction, it does not mean, um, do not translate into this how they might be using symbol prediction in their augmented communication system. So we're talking purely about the act of writing that we would like to see some of the beginnings of inventive spelling before we start to add word prediction to it. Um, I have found with some students that when they see that word prediction list, um, one, it's enticing to pick from that word predictor rather than to pick from the letters that might be hard because they don't know all of their letters yet. Not, you do not need to know all of your letters to be able to use word prediction, but we're, as, we're looking at, and there's not hard research on all of this, right? So this is things that we're finding in best practice to give them the opportunity to letter by letter write before we mediate it. For more information on that, um, look at the first author curriculum from Don Johnston and some of the guidance is there. I did not make any money off of that comment. I do do training for them, but I'm just, it's one of the guidances that's been very helpful me, for me and my emergent writers and to make some decisions. As we go through and take a look at products and people say, oh, these kinds of things that Kelly's been talking about or things that we're going to see um, demonstrated or in some examples, this is how you fill out the feature match list. What presentation of it? Do I need multiple colors within a screen? Do I need to have voice recognition as a, also as an option within the word predictor? Do I need, you know, what products are we looking at? And I know some people get wowed out by the form. It honestly is anything very simple, just to show you because I, I tried between our last session and now to just start a really basic um, word predictor um, feature match matrix. So, oh, and just quit out of here. Also doing some searches. So when we look at doing feature matches, I'm just using Google Sheets, Excel spreadsheet. I just start my columns out with the features that might be something that we're looking for. Um, so so what I've written down, if I'm looking for something that's compatible with Chrome, whether it's a Chromebook or a Chrome, you know, 
using being within the Chrome um, browser that I can open up other, I can open up on top of Word and other um, and, and Docs. Um, I might um, use the idea of grammar supports. I look at whether or not it also has built in voice recognition. So these kinds of things feed that top of the columns and then you have product names. So I might look at, um, you know, clicker writer. You know, I might look at clicker sentences and some of the other products. So what are all of these products? Um, sometimes I'm looking at things that are standalone. So it's a built-in word processor with word prediction or products that work, you know, alongside or on top of however you want to put that term. So products that um, are work on top of. in this case on top of Google Docs. So there might be standalone integrated systems, there might be things that work on top of other products. And then it's about going through and saying, um, is this built in? You know, is it built into that unless I add, so sometimes you're making qualifications. Sometimes it's not. You know, that piece of it, um, is it, oh, I've got two columns that are the same. Um, looking at, you know, does it have those things? Is it something, so I'm going through and usually putting yeses and nos. If I don't, you know, here for example, so if I don't know for sure about something, this is where you're looking for future search. And so I might highlight that those kinds of things, like I've got to find out about this. So we start to build feature match list on the things that you know about a student, the things that people suggest. I often have people to say, hey, we want to use read and write with this kid. And then I'll say, why? Why do you want to use the read and write um, app with this kid? And then they start to say, Oh, well, because we can move between typing, we can use voice recognition, we can get language supports with definitions. And so you start to teach people what this idea of features is and you start to fill your own knowledge bank on features by going to sessions from companies, by, uh, you know, webinars from companies. Many, as I mentioned, many of the companies have their own feature lists. And so I'll pull features from those various sources and we'll talk about some others like the unified list, closing the gap and other resources for, um, for that. So you create that feature match list and let's we'll take a look again at the more um, particular features of word prediction. Look at what operating system. I mean, that's usually my first item on a feature match is what, I, what am I on? What type of platform? Um, it's also gonna inform me about how large that feature match, I mean, the, the word predictor is going to take up on the screen. What type of program? I was mentioning things that are built in are things that are um, programs that they themselves are a word predictor all in one. So is it a transparent program? And by transparency, we mean those kinds of things that work transparent in whatever's on the screen. So it doesn't matter what product, as long as it's a product that accepts text, we'll take something from a word prediction list. We have some products that are dedicated word predictors. So if I'm in, um, a product like Kidogo, um, I also have a word prediction screen so that I can use the word prediction screen, but then this one also can be integrated into other assistive technologies like ProLoco2Go. Um, 
is it also have the ability to scan so that I can um, scan it using a single switch? Is it something that I can move it around from a horizontal presentation or a vertical presentation, those types of embedded programs? So just give you a little bit more information on each of those categories. For those programs that are transparent, they work within other applications, right? They often have predicted text. Sometimes it's based upon what um, is being typed on the screen. Um, there are some programs that like the ones from uh, Crick, where I can, I believe that's what I'm gonna get to on my next page. So products from Crick, when we're looking at things that work within their own application, may have the ability for you to create your own word banks and word predictions based upon documents that you scan in. Kelly, we can't see your uh, slide deck. Uh, well, that's not good. When share screen goes south. All right, I'm gonna back up a screen just so you see where I was talking from. So you have this in the handout. Platform, features of the type of program, and then this will go into more detail. Transparency of use. It works within other applications, not just its own. All right, so that predictive text gets sent to Google Docs. It gets sent to, you know, Word. It, you know, any of the key, any of the things that you're going to type in. You can use these kinds of transparent programs on top of Google Slides. You can use them on top of your putting things into PowerPoint. So it just really needs into your email. It just needs a blinking cursor and word prediction goes into those things from transparent programs that work within other applications. And then there's that category of, of that transparency of it only works within its own application. So some of the products from uh, Crick are like this, um, some of the other ones that you'll find, Ghostwriter, um, uh, Got It, they work in this modality as well. Um, Claris type has both, where it can work in other products and work in its own. So some are dual as it comes into transparency. In the case of some of these programs that work in their own application, you have the ability and, and, and the others as well to create your own word prediction. And we're gonna talk about, about topic files where it will scan the document and bring those words from the document into the word completion um, list. Selection methods, I've mentioned a couple of these before when we were looking at input is whether or not you need to click on the word. I might need to, there might be a number that's associated with the word list. And so then I'm typing the word, the number next to the word. There may be keyboard equivalents. So there are some things that might work off of function keys, for example, as you're choosing items from your word list, some things that are customizable. There, not every word prediction list is scannable. So if you have users of switches, single or dual switches, you need to look at what's built into the operating system um, that you can maybe turn everything into scanning or does it need to be built into that particular word prediction program? There are some word predictor lists. I know this seems kind of um, different in that there are some word predictions lists that have you select by voice and or add by voice so that I can go into voice typing mode, say what I need to say, and then go back into prediction mode. I can go back in, I can take my cursor and drop it into what I was using with voice typing and get words um, predicted. We've been using things like word queue that way. 
We've been using co-writer that way. So kids might do a brain dump with voice recognition and then use their word prediction program to go back and edit and improve the words um, that, are, uh, that were produced by their voice recognition system. One of the really concrete pieces of looking at word predictors are how much is in the window, where are things in the window? So you see a few examples here um, where it might be at the top of the keyboard. It might be a word prediction list that follows along within the window itself. It may be that you're seeing word prediction used as a part of word completion when you're doing Google searches. Um, you can enhance it using your word predictor, but some of those products have word prediction and phrase prediction, topic prediction built within them. So we're often layering the type of prediction, how much is predicted. If you're predicting by a word, a sentence, a phrase, kind of common phrase, and then of course that, whether it's in a fixed location or if it's in a moving location. Some people will also look as to the visual presentation as far as colors. Is it in a different color background screen than the screen that you're typing in? And is there spacing between the words for visual processing if needed? Some of the other things with appearance, I know some people that will that very much like their word prediction lists to match the text style, um, the, the font style, the color, those kinds of things that are in their word prediction, in their typing program. Um, and then I know other people that like their word prediction, visual appearance to be separate from, so that it's very clear, this is my word prediction or my word bank list. Um, and what is in that? Is it words? Is it emojis that are being predicted? Those types of things are all part of the consideration process. I had a student that we had to make sure that emojis weren't predicted because that's all he was choosing from. <laughs> it didn't help with the concreteness to the messages that he was typing. It added to the humor. Um, and then some other things that we look at is this idea of, is there flexibility to change? And I mentioned that before. I might start with having three predicted and some um, predicted and as they get used to word prediction, as their reading skills enhance or their use of the product itself enhance, make those lists longer. I'm gonna check in here with one of the questions that's in our chat, our Q&A. So when a student uses the system to click on a word, voice typing, et cetera, how would that teach them how to write without any systems? Interestingly enough, when we're looking at using word prediction, it is not about teaching children to write. So word prediction is an accommodation for writing during those times of writings when kids are struggling to produce the words in content area um, situations. When I'm in my English language arts classes, where I am te actively teaching children to write. So students are learning to write letter by letter. We don't have word prediction on during those times. If I'm doing spelling sentences and the act, you know, the, the task itself is about learning to spell. I'm not going to be using word prediction, but if it's about um, creating as many sentences as you can with this word, now it's about timing. So then I might turn word prediction on so they can produce as many sentences with as many supports as they can. So word prediction is one of those tricky things that it's not about being on all the time. It's very much tied to the task of writing and what it is that you're expecting them to do. Now they're having said, you know, this made this statement of uh, that word prediction is not about teaching children to write and to spell. We do have evidence, um, reported evidence in case studies where kids spelling has improved. We also have, there was a big research study done um, by George Carlin. Some of you know him from the AAC world, but in the writing world, 
George did a study out of the University of Illinois, one of them, um, that looked at using, and they were specifically looking at um, co-writer, and the writing support at the time of the study wasn't snap and read, it was called write out loud, but they were using the text to speech. I mean, they were using, yes, text to speech, so kids hearing what they were writing and word prediction at the same time. At that time in Illinois, those accommodations were not allowable on statewide testing. And what they found is in the group of students that had access throughout the school year, to the supports from word prediction and text to speech that their performance on the statewide test not using those tools was at a higher level than the group that did not have access to those products throughout the school year so the ways that you know they're not meant to teach but with consistent access to these kinds of tools it can support their writing their independent writing over time However, with me, independent writing can be with your word prediction system. For me, it's about how independent are they using their own word prediction system? You know, do they need to be coached in using that word prediction? Next word, next word, next word. Or are they starting to choose words independently from the word predictor list? So independence in writing um, is all about what your end goal is and what the task at hand is very much tied, like every other assistive technology thing, it's tied to the task. Um, so some of the things I mentioned about adjusting that list is about period of time for reading um, the list and choosing the items from that list. So you've got some feedback on that. Typing assistance wise, I've mentioned already, we look at do you need as a feature that automatic spacing after a word is chosen, automatic capitalization, um, and abbreviation expansion? So abbreviation expansion is separate from word prediction in that in abbreviation expansion, we're looking at, can I put things like the initials of my name, KF, and when I do KF space, it doesn't give me a whole list of words that are predicted, but it puts my name on the page. So we can use those features to assist students. How is the prediction happening in the system? Is it based upon alphabetical order? And that's what you see the list in. And in case, some cases of kids that are hyperlexic, if their word prediction list isn't in alphabetical order, they're spending time reordering it while they're looking at it. And um, that becomes you know, a wasted writing opportunity. We have some systems that are just about word completion. It will only predict words in the list as you exactly have typed them. So for example, if I'm putting in the word, I'm always using this example, telephone, and I type the T-E-L-E, -E, or maybe I forgot to type the second E and I put an F in, only systems that are based upon um, phonetic principles, looking at word patterns, those kinds of things are going to help the poor speller. Systems that are tied to word completion are only predicting things as you've spelled them. So in the case of the student that went T-E-L-F, that's the words that'll be in the list, which at some point will probably be a blank list because there isn't any more words that are spelled in the way that they've spelled them. Some lists are on frequency of use with the, that as somebody's typing, the words that are the highest frequently um, used words. So if you look at things that are based upon um, the most commonly used 100 words in writing, separate from core vocabulary and expressive communication for talking, um, but what are our writing common lists? Are things predicted in patterns, so in pairs? And are they predicted linguistically? So you've got all of these different supports. There are some things like in Kurzweil, well, where the, in my word prediction and word completion list, it will point out to me homophones. Uh, read and write does that as well. So I might have there, there, and there. 
and I can get a grammar support associated in that list and have it, you know, a sentence shown to me so I know which two, two, or two, um, T-O, T-O-O, T-W-O to pick. There are some word, more robust word prediction systems that you can set them up to not predict until after somebody has initiated the first letter so that we know that the word is coming from that student. Of course, you want to use this with a, a student that has first letter kind of phonemic awareness. Um, and so things that come after that get predicted. And then we look at customizable um, dictionaries. So let me show you some examples from that. When we have systems that are based upon phonetic prediction, as I mentioned, they might use things like grammar to help with the more likely word. So those kind of specialty pieces um, so that I'm getting the right verb tense to go along with the subject. Vocabulary size impacts word prediction whether they're working from where you can choose a core list, what that core list is based upon, everyday words, confusable words, you're gonna find those options. This screenshot here is from within Kurzweil. Um, that use of custom dictionaries, what might be called topic dictionaries, um, things where it will learn. There are some systems that will learn words as students type them. Um, this could be for the good and the not so good. So if you have a student that has a unique vocabulary, they have or words that they're learning um, as a part of a unit as they type them that will go into the word bank that words come from. But if they've misspelled, it may go into the word bank as well and you'll see those misspellings come up. Some of you might experience this on the word completion list on your cell phones. If you've mistyped, while you've been texting, those mistyped words will get predicted over and over again, unless you have a system that you can go into the options and delete those misspellings. There are some of the more robust word prediction systems that will not capture misspelled words. Um, they're just automatically left out of the prediction list for future. So that's Got some things here on that. Um, will it automatically learn those new words? Can you clean out those new words? Can you clean out misspellings? Are definitely an issue. Um, and so for some of my emergent writers, they may have a, a key, uh, like an alternative keyboard that has word prediction built in. And we may turn word prediction off in some of the early stages of their learning to use that new keyboard so that while they're they're so that their keyboarding abilities aren't impacting the word prediction list. So we might turn off that learning feature with it that way. Um, and then something that people have we've had for a while in, in a variety of products is this idea to create custom dictionaries, not just from learning as somebody types, but to be able to input from a word list or input from a document. And or doing a Google search in the background, as in the case of CoWriter, where a uh, topic dictionary, when I go to that screen and I type in presidential election, those terms that have to do with writing about what's um, the presidential election will come up into the frequency of use. And then I can turn that off when I go to write about marine animals. So if I write about marine mammals, I'm going to have that word prediction list up. And so those animals that are a part of that and the terms about marine biology will start coming up in that word prediction list. And the things that were about American politics and American history will be set aside until that gets turned on when I'm writing about that topic. So topic dictionaries are um, custom vocabularies can be very powerful tools as long as they are um, learned to activate and deactivate them for different writing scenarios. And for me, this is a part of teaching kids to be more independent in their use of their custom dictionaries and their word prediction system. 
you know, how easy is it to do that? How easy it is to create a custom dictionary may be an impact on your feature match process. And then, um, you know, what kind of auditory feedback are you getting? Are you working within a program that automatically gives speech feedback? Or are you getting all of your speech feedback, like in Microsoft Word, which typically doesn't talk um, without some other things added in, which is another workshop in itself. Um, but for Microsoft Word, if it doesn't have speech as an output or other products that don't have typically have speech as an output, can I add auditory feedback from my list? So things from your cell phone, can I have things read out loud based upon turning on speech and speech feedback? And what units is it saying? You know, is it saying words from the list? Is it saying words as I put them into my document? Is it um, waiting until I do a sentence ending? Is it waiting until I do an enter or a return key till it reads everything back to me? Some of the other kinds of things here, you know, just to give you some examples, is can I get auditory feedback um, to visually track? So that as it's reading out loud, can I work with some of those principles of text-to-speech programs? So I'm being shown the items as they're being read, especially if I'm going to be choosing words out of thesaurus, as well as out of my word prediction list. Um, are there things that word prediction can help in correcting? So, you know, um, for those pieces. Word completion, as I mentioned before, is a little bit more limiting because it's only going to go, here's the telephone example, that it's only going to predict words that are within that list. So you need to, and often word completion might be associated with some of free technologies and free apps. Word banks and word clouds are also static in nature in that we create them based upon topics or specific supports. So here are some examples from um, Don Johnston's word bank that can be presented as a word cloud or a word list. You've got um, clickers and, and clicks products that have word banks um, within them like Clicker Writer and some of the other tools. Uh, and then you also see from Kurzweil, how some of their word banks can be created almost in word wall style. They, um, and I've seen this list for people in printed means as well with lists of adverbs, powerful verbs, um, adjectives that you might want to use based upon um, the grade level and the writing abilities. We move very quickly through this um, presentation. So I want to just talk a little bit about what are the items or what are some of the things that you want to do with word prediction? Why are you using it? Are you using it to reduce keystrokes, fatigue? Are you using it to assist somebody with grammar or the length of which they are producing, you know, of what they're producing? Are you trying to use it to get some of those other um, mechanics of writing supports? such as spacing and those things automated so that somebody doesn't have to do another keystroke once they've written a word or typed a word and they don't have to type the space bar. You'll use that feature match list. We've given some examples. I don't need to, to review this much more other than there's nothing fancy about this piece of paper other than you are making sure that you're looking at products based upon features, not on features as, you know, who the kid sitting next to your student and what they're using. I mean, that's one thing that influences us. Some um, ideas, some other places to go, and I was, had kind of started back on this list, um, is if you are, for example, doing a search in Google, you know, looking at apps, typing in word prediction, um, you'll get some interesting things, but you know, you'll, the explanations will talk about how the prediction happens, where it happens on the screen. 
Um, we often will introduce word prediction in one environment at a time. That's not a must, uh, but it is a consideration. Um, we tend to introduce new writing things in writing environments that are not content heavy, stressful, um, because I want them to start learning to use that word predictor and something like journal writing, you know, something that where the output is not being assessed in a detrimental way in any way. Um, you might turn off some of those word prediction features based upon um, if you're in a testing situation or the what the purpose of the English language arts class that you're in. Um, we might look at teaching kids strategies. If the word that you're looking for isn't in the list, go back and change the first vowel. Go back and change the consonant um, that's in it. So that that might change the words that are in your list. And it also makes them a more active part of the process. Um, please remember that if you have any system that's collecting personal words, um, that you review it for personally misspelled words um, and creating custom dictionaries. Finally, here are some places which you can go and look for word prediction systems. The Tech Matrix and the Unified Listing are both free sites that you can type in word prediction. You can do searches based in um, the Unified Listing. You can do searches based upon a word prediction program that you might know already and it will pull up others so that you can read through them. Word prediction is also addressed in the Call Scotland um, wheels where they look at it based the tools based upon platform iPad Android Chromebook um, and you'll see that for writing and reading around the center you'll look for the term word prediction and then go out into that spoke to see what are some of those tools like Claris, Read and Write, Co-Writer, um, some of the other word prediction programs, Got It, those kinds of things that people are using. With that, we're gonna check back with the Q&A and see what else Tammy might have to share with you. Thank you so much for um, spending this time with us and looking at word prediction for your students. Thank you, Kelly, so much. Uh, this is your last chance to ask questions for her in the, in the uh, Q&A feature that flags her or enter something in the chat box. I just entered the um, information with the code. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can also see um, the information, give me a second. Uh, and then let's see, there we go. So um, just remember to be eligible to receive Act 48 hours or ACRV, um, ACV or AP credit or certificate of attendance. You must complete the survey online um, on before Wednesday, uh, September 16th. Um, there's also, if you are looking for uh, after credit, you'll need to download the bubble sheet and complete it, then upload it to the survey. The survey must compl be completed again by September 16th if, uh, at 4 p.m. It will turn into a pumpkin and disappear. Um, <laughs> and uh, I tried to make it really easy for you guys to take a picture or um, do a QR code. Um, but again, Kelly, thank you on behalf of Patton. I would really like to, um, I just can't say enough for all of the information that you shared and uh, the valuable tech tips and uh, resources about word prediction for our attendees. Thank you all for joining us. I can see we've got some stuff in the chat window. Um, let me see if I can find, uh, yeah, I can't see the chat window. Oh, here we go. Um, and we have lots of, thank you, Kelly's. Um, Chan uh, Chantel, Shelly, if you can't get it to open, uh, try in the um, chat window the 
resources that I've loaded there. Everything has two links. One is the, the bit.ly, the other one is the actual live link to either the form site for the survey or the actual website for the handouts. Um, if you can't find the ASHA sheet, it is embedded within the survey itself. Um, but, uh, and the, yes, thank you, Marianne. The survey will not be active for uh, like another 30 seconds. It should be active around now 4.15. Um, but I will check into that. Give me about 15 minutes. If it's not live now, I will make sure it's ready by 4.30. All right. And Tammy, we have two people with their hands raised in the attendee list. Oh, interesting. All right, so. All three people. <laughs> all right, let's see what we got going on here. Uh, There's a Rose and a Marine. Okay. Um, oh, or, oh, or they okay. just found out that they had their hand raised and they didn't know it. Okay. If Again, if you have questions, last chance to ask Kelly any questions. Otherwise, she's available via email. Um, you can also email me at assistive tech connect at patentkop.net. Otherwise, hopefully you all found this information helpful. And uh, thank you again, Kelly. You are very welcome.